Hey everyone, Father Lane here. Welcome to another class in our course on the prophetic literature. And today you can see we have moved south to San Diego, home not just of the Padres, but also home to one of the great naval installations for our country's military. And it's appropriate that we come to San Diego for this first class on the text of Isaiah. We'll be looking at the first 12 chapters of the book. I have to be honest though, Isaiah is not really known for navies per se, because all of the main cities of Israel and Judah are in the hill country, so naval battles aren't much of a thing in the Old Testament. However, much of Isaiah is about the military. Indeed, the Lord is constantly called the Lord of hosts, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Our focus today, however, will be to do an overview of the entire book, and then we'll look at the first four chapters, the introduction to the entire book, and then chapters 5 through 12, which are usually known as the Emmanuel cycle for the recurrence of that theme, Emmanuel, God is with us. So let's start with our synchronic survey. We talked in our last class about how the book of Isaiah seems to have been written over a long swath of time. And here's an example of what Sweeney argues that might look like. Sweeney argues that the book of Isaiah contains prophecy that would have been uttered first to a wide variety of audiences spanning four different centuries. That it would have begun in the 8th century when Assyria was the main threat to both the northern and southern kingdoms but then pieces would have been added during the Josian period, and then words, especially of consolation, would have been given to the exiles who were optimistic that they would soon be allowed to return home under the Persian Empire, and then finally that the last bit of prophecy would have been given to Jews who were trying to rebuild their world, to rebuild their lives after the exile. We can therefore think of Isaiah as having two main parts. The first 33 chapters, are where God has a plan to reveal his power on Mount Zion, where God announces that he plans to instruct the nations on Mount Zion. And then the last 33 chapters, where he actually does instruct people from Mount Zion. These first four chapters are introductory. Let's begin with the first words of actual prophecy in the book after the superscription in the first verse. Chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Hear, O heavens, and listen, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons have I raised and reared, but they have rebelled against me. An ox knows its owner and an ass its master's manger, but Israel does not know, my people has not understood. You can see I've color-coded the different elements in this poetry. This is a prophetic lawsuit. The Lord is the prosecutor. He's calling upon heaven and earth, literally all of his creation, to bear witness to the injustice that has been committed against him. He calls Israel his sons, his people, this group that he's intimately close to, but they've rebelled. They don't know, they don't understand. Indeed, an ox is at least smart enough to know its owner. An ass, a donkey, is at least smart enough to know where it can get its food from. But Israel, my people, this people I have raised, they're so stupid, they don't even know what an ox or a donkey knows. Hmm, not a bad beginning for Isaiah. What does Isaiah want? He says so clearly in the opening chapter, wash yourselves clean, put away your misdeeds, cease doing evil, learn to do good, make justice your aim or seek justice, redress the wronged, hear the orphans plea, defend the widow. Notice the covenant theology present here in Isaiah. Isaiah is going to talk a lot about idolatry, about proper worship. He's also going to talk a lot about social justice, and this is what's crucial. There is no divorce between the first three commandments and the last seven. One who is faithful to the Lord's instruction is one who follows all of it. Period. The end. So these first four chapters set the stage for the instruction the Lord's going to give. And then we move to the Emmanuel cycle, which begins with the famous Song of the Vineyard, which we'll look at in a second. But here's the trajectory of the whole cycle. It begins with the basis for judgment. There's a lot of judgment oracles here. And then Isaiah tells us his vocation story in chapter 6. And we learn that he's a prophet who's commissioned to speak, but commissioned largely to be ignored. And then in chapter 7 through 11, the prophet interprets what's happening as the Assyrian Empire threatens the southern kingdom and exiles the northern kingdom. It all begins during the period of King Ahaz, during the Syro-Ephraimite War, when Syria, that is Aram, and the northern kingdom want the southern kingdom, Judah, to form a hedge against Assyria. Instead, the southern kingdom chooses to align itself with the Assyrian Empire. 
Isaiah tells us that Assyria is like a hired razor whose job it is to shave Israel, that is to humiliate them, to emasculate them. But Assyria is merely a hired hand. Assyria's dominance will have an expiration date and God will do something new with a Davidic king, at which time there will be the great song of victory, which is what chapter 12 is. Chapter 12 is the song of victory that we often use in our Catholic liturgy. It's used at the Easter Vigil. The song celebrates salvation, that is deliverance from wrath, deliverance from disaster. So let's look at Isaiah 5, the song of the vineyard. It really is quite poignant. Here's the crux of it. What more could be done for my vineyard that I did not do? Here, the prophet likens Israel to this vineyard that God has cultivated and God has made his people so beautiful. He's done everything for his people, but the vineyard hasn't produced anything good. So now I will let you know what I'm going to do for my vineyard. Take away its hedge, give it to grazing, break through its wall, let it be trampled, and the judgment oracle is on. Isaiah is called to proclaim this judgment. He hears about it and he must be horrified. In Isaiah 6, 11, he says, How long, O Lord? And the Lord replies, Until the cities are desolate, without inhabitants, houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste. Notice the theodicy here. God is allowing this evil to happen. The Lord is the Lord of hosts. He's called that often in Isaiah. Indeed, you can see here in this chart, Lord of hosts is used a lot in Isaiah and Jeremiah, as well as some of the other prophetic books. But Lord of hosts, literally a host is an army. That is, the Lord controls all the armies. So the Lord can help Israel's army, as he did say back in the book of Joshua. He can also help the armies that are trying to harm Israel if he wants to punish Israel. Right now, the Lord does want to harm Israel. The Lord is punishing Israel, and he says so. We're in Isaiah chapter 10. Ah, Assyria, the rod of my wrath, the staff I wield in anger. Assyria is playing this role of an instrument of punishment, a rod. You know, a rod's what you use to punish, to beat somebody with. But here's where Isaiah tells us that Assyria's dominance has an expiration date. But when the Lord has brought to an end all his work on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, I will punish the utterance of the king of Assyria's proud heart and the boastfulness of his haughty eyes. God is with us, Emmanuel. We read it in chapter 7, chapter 8. The key question, is God's presence a good thing? Is he coming to save us? Or is he coming to punish us? Is he coming to convict us? It's a little bit of both right here. The good news is the story has a happy ending. We move to chapter 11, this famous passage we often read around Christmas time. But a shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a bud shall blossom. And then it continues on to say, on that day, the root of Jesse set up as a signal for the peoples. Him the nations will seek out. His dwelling shall be glorious. And what's notable here, it's cryptic, the stump of Jesse. A stump implies there once was a tree that was cut down. So it's possible that this oracle has gone through a few stages of meaning, a few stages of interpretation. It's possible that in the eighth century, it's talking about Hezekiah, this good king who's gonna come about and put an end to the disaster brought by his father, King Ahaz. Could also refer to Josiah, another great Davidic king who's gonna try and reclaim the, the territory lost in the Northern Kingdom as Assyria's dominance starts to wane. But none of them really brought peace it leaves it open to a future sprout, a future king from David's line. Of course, that's what the New Testament is going to interpret this text to mean. A lot going on here in this part of Isaiah. We'll explore it further in our next class. Until then, read well and pray well.